Welcome to Health Watch. I'm Dr. Trudy Hall, Vice President of Medical Affairs at Laurel Regional Hospital. Recently, Maryland's Governor Larry Hogan announced that he has an aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The governor vowed to stay on the job and immediately began chemotherapy treatment. So what exactly is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and just how treatable is this form of cancer? I recently spoke with Maryland oncologist Dr. Kashif Ali about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to find out more. So Dr. Ali, what is lymphoma? So lymphoma is a cancer of the lymphatic system. So what that is, is uh, a group of lymph nodes or glands that are throughout your body, to everywhere in your body. And the purpose of these uh, lymph nodes is to filter out waste out of your body. And um, within these lymph nodes, we have cells called lymphocytes. Now lymphocytes, their normal function is to help fight bacteria and viruses and prevent these infections from going into your bloodstream. Um, occasionally what happens is that these lymphocytes will start to divide uncontrollably and turn into what we call lymphoma cells. And the lymphoma cells differ from regular lymphocytes in that lymphoma cells have the ability to invade and also to spread to other parts of your body. So what would be some early symptoms and some late symptoms that you know a person may experience that would tell them that maybe they could have this disease? So generally, uh, the early symptoms are basically lumps or bumps on your body. So lymph nodes are everywhere in your body, but the ones you generally feel are the ones in your neck, under your arms, and in your groin. Uh, so those are usually the earliest signs. Unfortunately, most of the lymph nodes are in other parts of the body where you do, will not see them and you will not feel them. So later on in the disease, when the disease is a bit more advanced, you know, patients can develop what we call B symptoms. So B symptoms are fevers, chills, night sweats, and weight loss. So what's important to note is that these can sometimes occur in other diseases besides lymphomas also. So it's important that if you have any of these and they, will, and they do not go away to, you know, talk to your primary care doctor and uh, help determine whether you may be at risk for developing lymphoma. So how does a doctor diagnose lymphoma? Generally the easiest place to look for lymph nodes because not only do you look at yourself in the mirror every day, but other people will notice if there's any lymph node that's enlarged. You know, like with, with Governor Hogan, uh, that's where you notice the lymph node is on his neck. Um, you can also feel them under your arms or in the groin area, but neck is obviously the place where usually most of the time you will see them. So uh, historically, uh, lymphomas were diagnosed by doing a lymph node biopsy. So you would want to remove a whole lymph node that you suspect may be uh, consisting of lymphoma and look at it under the microscope. But some of the newer techniques now, you could even do a needle biopsy of a lymph node or even a blood test that looks for certain markers on the outside of the, lymph, uh, on the, outside of the lymphocytes to determine if any of them may be uh, lymphoma cells. And you know, most of these newer techniques are looking at the genetics within the lymphocytes to determine not only what type of lymphoma it is, but also what uh, type of treatments this particular type of lymphoma may respond to. Now there's two main types of lymphomas. There's Hodgkin's lymphomas and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Generally a pathologist will look under the microscope and if he or she sees a certain type of cell called a Reed-Sternberg cell, they will come to the diagnosis of a Hodgkin's lymphoma, whereas a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma would not have that. It's important to differentiate between the two since the treatments are completely different for the two different types of lymphomas. So who is at greater risk for developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is more likely to be seen in certain types of people. So generally patients age 60 or over Unfortunately, men see, have it more than women, and we don't really know exactly why. There's still some research being done as to why men may have it more than others. And we know this in other type of cancers, too, where men may have you know, more uh, cancer risk compared to women. Um, certain ethnicities will have lymphomas more than others. Non certain ethnicities will have non-Hodgkin's lymphomas more than others. For example, whites are more at risk than uh, African Americans or Asian Americans. Um, certain parts of the country or the world may have uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma more than others. Uh, for example, developing countries like the United States or Western Europe has a higher chance of developing lymphomas compared to um, uh, developing countries. Uh, certain environmental hazards, like for example, patients that are exposed to benzenes, 
uh, may have a higher risk than, uh, than others. And uh, patients that are exposed to radiation, either through an atomic bomb um, exposure or from a nuclear accident. Uh, patients that have received radiation for other types of cancers um, can develop lymphomas later in life. And unfortunately, patients that have been treated successfully for one type of uh, cancer with chemotherapy may develop lymphoma as a risk of the chemotherapy itself. Now, um, there are certain autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and celiac disease which increase your risk for developing lymphoma. Sometimes even a simple bacterial infection like H. pylori, which is an infection that can happen in your stomach, that can develop into a lymphoma. And the treatments for all these different types of lymphomas can vary depending on a lot of times what actually causes a lymphoma. So there's been a, a lot of media coverage um, on lymphoma. So again, there's a lot of myths that are out there. Can you give us some clarity to some of these myths? So a lot of times when patients come to see me, you know, they have these rumors that they've heard, either to, from family members or friends or from other patients that may have gone through a different type of cancer. So one of those is that a biopsy can spread cancer. That's not true for lymphomas. Now, that may be true for other, certain other type of cancers, like kidney cancers and, and liver cancers, but it is not true for lymphoma. For lymphoma, actually, the biopsy is very important because that is the only way we can tell whether, you know, what type of lymphoma you have, what type of treatments you may need, and how you'll respond to treatment. Another myth that we commonly hear is that, uh, is that all lymphomas need treatments. Now, not all lymphomas need treatments. Uh, so there's some lymphomas that may never need treatment. Some lymphomas can be treated with antibiotics alone, and there's other lymphomas that need chemotherapy or radiation. So another myth that we commonly hear is that lymphomas are all genetic. Now, it's true that you know, certain cancers like breast cancer, where we've, we've identified a mutation, like the BRCA mutation that Angelina Jolie had, um, you know, those patients have up to 80% chance of developing breast or ovarian cancer. With lymphoma, that's not the case, at least up to what we know right now is that there's no inherited mutation that we can detect that tells us early on that you're going to develop lymphoma. Most lymphomas are developed through acquired mutations that happen later in life, either through hazards that you may be exposed to or other means that develop into lymphomas. So you've kind of led me into my other question, which is now you have a patient who's been diagnosed. What are some of the treatment options? Now the treatment options for lymphomas can vary. You know, some very early stage low grade lymphomas don't need treatment. And all we do is we observe these. Um, you know, some patients go their whole life without ever needing treatment for, for their lymphoma. However, you know, some patients may need treatment right away. Like for example, with Governor Hogan, you know, his type of lymphoma, which is a very aggressive lymphoma, those patients would need treatment, you know, w even within a week. Now treatments can vary. It, you know, treatments can be radiation alone, it can be chemotherapy alone, or it could be a combination of both, where as one may need chemotherapy followed by radiation. Um, there are also other newer treatments out, which are still, still under research, uh, which are immune therapies. You know, those will, we will probably hear about in the coming future. So I know you are not the treating physician um, for, um, for the governor. Um, what can you tell us based on the information we do have um, about his prognosis? As far as prognosis goes for lymphomas, uh, generally we look at what's called a prognostic index. What that means is that um, the risk factors that a patient may have. So first thing is the type of lymphoma that you have. Now different lymphomas, as we know, may have a higher survival rate than others. Uh, the other is certain risk factors, which include age, the stage at the time that the lymphoma was diagnosed, uh, how many lymph node sites are involved, and more importantly, how many lymph node sites are involved outside of the lymph nodes. Lymphomas can also involve lung, liver, and other parts. Um, sorry. How your blood counts look at the time of diagnosis. Patients that have lower blood counts won't do as well. Um, how, you know, how elevated your marker is in your blood. There's a marker called LDH. When patients have an elevated LDH marker, they don't do as well as ones that have normal LDH markers. So what we do is we take all these factors, we give one point for each factor, we add them up, and then we can determine you know, how well a person may do with treatment. Now, there's a big variance. Now, a, a patient with a early stage low-grade lymphoma has a over 90% chance of being alive at five years or greater. Whereas someone with a very poor risk, high-grade lymphoma, has a 
chance of being alive at five years or later of 50 percent. So it can vary really from person to person. Now, from what we know about Governor Hogan and what the information that he's been given, and based on the current um, treatment modalities that we have to our disposal, I feel that he's going to do very well with treatment. And to go on with his uh, usual duties, I feel that he has a very good chance. Well, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I learned a lot today about lymphoma, and really we appreciate all the work that you do here at Laurel and um, for talking to our uh, audience today. Okay, thank you very much. We all need a helping hand sometimes, and that's especially true if you suffered a major illness that can cause a disability, such as a stroke or multiple sclerosis. Or maybe you suffered an injury from a fall in your own home. These are just a few instances when you might need physical rehabilitation services. Physical rehabilitation helps people adapt to the challenges of everyday life despite having a physical impairment. An amputee may need to learn how to make dinner at home. A stroke patient may need to learn how to swallow food again. And someone with a back injury may need to learn exercises to strengthen the spine. Cheryl Lowry is the Director of Physical and Occupation Rehabilitation Services at Laurel Regional Hospital. We recently spoke about the many rehabilitation services available and the team's approach to restoring one's physical well-being here in the Laurel community. Tell us a little bit about the therapies that you offer here. Well, we offer physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Mm -hmm. So not all therapy is the same. So what exactly is physical therapy? Physical therapy, and I think most people are, are very understanding that it has to do with physical or mobility. Physical therapists work with exercising and strengthening the body. They work on ambulation or walking. And in the case of inpatient rehab, really focusing on functional mobility or functional movement to help a patient return to the community. And occupational therapy, which you are occupational therapist. Tell us a little bit about that level of specialty. Yes, occupational therapy, most people think it's referring to occupation or work. Occupational therapy refers to life work or activities that a person does that are functional in their lives. So occupational therapists, we will work a lot on the upper part of the body, activities of daily living, dressing, grooming, um, it may be eating, it may, might be home types of things, all types of activities that a person does in their life throughout their day. We focus on that in rehab so that they can return to the community and doing those things more independently. And what about speech therapy? Speech therapy works on, of course, speech, speech and language. Also, um, they have a very good specialty in swallowing. So oftentimes stroke patients or other patients that are neurologically involved have difficulty in swallowing and feeding. And so they, they specialize in that area to help a patient be able to do that safely. They work a lot with our cognitively impaired patients um, to improve their ability in thinking and processing information. And that works also with their language in order for them to be more successful and independent. So can someone just look at a patient and tell that they're not swallowing properly? No, they would have to have um, an evaluation. Now nurses are able to tell maybe if a patient is coughing when they're eating, um, maybe if there is excessive drooling and they're not able to manage um, their secretions, uh, not secretions, well, could be secretions, but also saliva in their mouths. But the speech therapists also do a very specialized evaluation. They may do a video fluoroscopy evaluation with radiology to actually see inside as the food is going down what is happening. So for those of you, for those of the viewers who do not know, in an acute rehab setting, um, it is really a team approach. So tell us about how the team approach at an acute rehab really focuses in a different way than um, where you may be getting therapies at other facilities that may not work as a team. Well, there is a whole multidisciplinary approach to looking at each patient. When all of the therapies evaluate patients, they have rounds together, and that's led by Dr. Nekritz. Um, so they are looking at goals for the whole the whole patient and all of the different therapies. The therapists oftentimes co-treat together um, because the therapy is intense in an inpatient rehab setting. In this setting in particular, um, the therapists are working maybe several hours a day with a patient. And that may be throughout the day broken up. 
It may be a combination of therapies working together. One therapy may do one thing specific and then the two therapists may do some things together. So you do have quite a team approach because the goal is to get the patient more functional than when they came, came in and hopefully to return to the community. What are some of the challenges that you see in trying to get the patients back to what we often call their pre-morbid state or before they actually had something bad happen to them? What are some of the challenges that you, that you see? Well, I think uh, some of the challenges have to do with how long you're able to keep a patient. You know, we're not able to keep a patient probably as long as we would like to keep a patient. Um, so we, we very much rely on our outpatient services so that there's more of a continuum of care. We also sometimes rely on other facilities if a patient is going to need some, some very long-term care after they leave us. Um, our goal really is to be able to maximize as much therapy as we can and, and concentrate it in the amount of time that we have. Right. So some patients' recovery may be a little slower than others, so um, at least when they're here, they'll get that intensive therapy that will kind of give them a little bit of a, a, a jump start. What's the difference between home therapy and outpatient therapy? I know we have outpatient therapies here mm -hmm. at um, Laurel Regional Hospital, and then we have all of these mom and pop therapy places that are popping up. So mm -hmm. what's, what's a little bit of the differences? Well, home therapy is for patients that are homebound. Mm -hmm who are not able to come out into the community to receive therapy. Outpatient therapy is a, is a patient that actually can come out or the family can bring them out. They are able to tolerate that transportation to and from therapy. And those are patients oftentimes where we are doing, if they've had inpatient rehab already, we're doing more refinement of their skills. And it's good to have outpatients because they, they go home and they can practice what they're learning in therapy. And they're given home programs and things to do at home as well, and we can keep track of that if they're coming like three times a week. The other thing I want to talk about that we see, we see fractures. Mm -hmm. um, we see patients that are in the community and they are at risk for fall. Do you have any advice about um, home safety or decreasing any risk factors for fall or fracture? Well, that's one thing that therapists generally go over with um, our patients, especially our neurologically involved patients and, and actually in patient education and education to the family is safety in the home. Occupational therapists focus a lot on that, looking at home safety, looking at the bathroom as one area, which we, we consider that to be the most dangerous That's room the danger zone. in your house exactly. because so many slips and falls and they're hard surfaces. So, you know, we look at um, if there are any things that we can adapt in the home. Let's say you, you may have scatter rugs, so we, we need to remove scatter rugs that cause people to slip in the bathroom. We want to have, if, if we need an adapted um, tub seat so that patients are not standing and trying to balance while they're, or they're bathing. Also, you know, a rubber tight mat in the bathtub itself. Um, it may be grab bars that patients need for home safety. So we, we look at where a patient is going, their home situation. We ask them very specific questions about how their home is set up. And then we, we try to simulate that in a fashion. We do have a kitchen here where we actually can take patients and have them go through some ADL types of things or activities of daily living. They may have to make a cup of coffee or do, you know, some small meal preparation so that we can get an idea of safety for them. Great. Well, thank you, Cheryl. You actually gave us a lot of information. So thank you for having us come to the acute rehab unit at Laurel Regional Hospital. Well, you're welcome. The key to restoring physical health also includes having a positive mental outlook. In the addition to a team approach to physical rehabilitation, Laurel Regional Hospital also provides many support groups and programs to promote health and wellness. They include support groups for patients living with Parkinson's disease, patients healing from a joint replacement surgery, and patients recovering from a stroke. Family members are encouraged to join patients as they do physical workout sessions at Laurel Regional Hospital. It's the perfect way to support loved ones as they recover from physical setbacks. That's it for this edition of Health Watch. Until next time, I'm Dr. Trudy Hall. Stay well and have positive thoughts of wellness.